last week we discussed the rapture and I really didn't even go into as much detail as, as I could have. That was, it was a very kind of just right off the cuff of overview of the rapture. And so what I thought I would do before we jump into uh, today, uh, which the topic is this age and the age to come, uh, I thought what I would do is just give a really brief overview of last week. There were some things I wasn't able to cover, um, but I'm going to do it in a very abbreviated way to segue into our lesson today. Um, so Josh, by the way, if you want to go back and watch the class, you can do that on our YouTube page. You can also do that uh, by the previous email that was sent out to the church included um, my notes for the class. And in those notes included um, some, some scriptures we didn't have time to get to. And so some of those will be just included in this kind of overview. But to kind of just paint a picture of what we discussed last week about the rapture, we looked at two passages of scripture in particular. We looked at 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Thessalonians 5. And the main idea of what Paul was trying to explain to the Thessalonians was what it means that Christ is going to return and what it means for us when we think about Christians who have fallen asleep. And of course, that means uh, the idea of somebody who is a believer that dies. In the case of the context in 1 Thessalonians, believer who dies prior to Jesus returning. That was at the forefront of that consideration by Paul. So just a couple things to note that we looked at. Um, when Jesus uses the term sleep, he correlates it with a familiar context that we see earlier on in the New Testament. That, of course, is the story of Lazarus. You know, Jesus makes the point when it has to do with Lazarus that he has, in fact, died, and he goes to raise him from the dead. So what's in view is a resurrection. What is the remedy for Lazarus having fallen asleep or having died? The remedy is a resurrection from the dead. The same thing is happening in 1 Thessalonians 4. When Paul talks about Jesus returning, he uses the language that we will be caught up with Jesus. And that phrase of being caught up, it signifies an idea of a display of force or a display of victory, an idea of seizing a bounty. So it's nothing nothing similar to an idea of a secret or quiet or invisible event, which matters for us because that's the main argument being made in dispensationalism is that you have in First Thessalonians 4 a secret uh, rapture event where the problem is all of these things are nothing secret at all. Everything is this grand displayed event. Josh, you better eat your glasses. <laughs> sorry, I'm just, I see your screen right there. <laughs> I should have paused. I'm sorry for this. <laughs> that's okay. Um, so that's, that's the idea that Paul wants us to understand that this, in fact, is an event that is grand, that is visible, that is loud, if we want to use that phrase too, because this is a cry of command, a sound of a trumpet. So this is certainly a grand event that we should look forward to. He also makes the point that when we meet the Lord in the air, he says, and so we will always be with the Lord. Now, what matters with him saying a phrase like that is that Paul wants us to understand that whatever it is that's happening in 1 Thessalonians 4 is an event of finality. It's an event of consummation. We'll meet the Lord in the air. And so, conclusion, we will always be with the Lord. So he wants us to understand that whatever is being explained by him in that passage is a, in terms of, of final. It's not a temporal, it's not an intermediate period of time being explained. It's a moment of finality. And 
when we think about the structure of Paul's words, bringing all that together, it means this. At the very least, a secret rapture event that is a temporal event, not to be confused with Jesus' second coming, is a questionable interpretation at best, and I think a problematic one that doesn't work at the end of the day um, in the final analysis. So that was our conclusion, was that whatever the rapture is, we don't want to deny that there is one, but we do want to deny the way it's explained by dispensationalism, and that is, it is the secret event that takes the church away from the earth for this intermediate point of time, and Jesus returns in some way, but it's not actually his second coming, which we become familiar to referring to in all of our historic creeds and confessions, including what we read in the broad scope of the New Testament. And then we got to 1 Thessalonians 5, and dispensational theology makes a point that, well, 1 Thessalonians 4 is about the rapture. 1 Thessalonians 5 is about Jesus' second coming. But we also covered that there's no reason for us to look at the structure of these two chapters and think that Paul is talking about two completely different events. It's better that we look at these structures of the two chapters, not as a shift in thought, but as a shift in time frame. So Paul explains the what of Jesus' second coming, 1 Thessalonians 4, what we have to look forward to, and then he explains the when in 1 Thessalonians 5, and he does it primarily not by saying, here's all the things you need to look out for, but he makes the point that what you should be concerned with is living for the Lord. Because if you're not, the day is going to creep upon you like a thief in the night. And then he makes the point, but we are not like those who are drunk or anything like that. We are those who await for Jesus that whether we die or whether we live, we will live with him and live for him. So that's the point he makes in verse 4 of 1 Thessalonians 5. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. So again, the point is, what we looked at in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5 is a continual discussion about the same thing. It's just that Paul is handling two different aspects of it. Whereas in dispensational theology, they want to make a hard line separation between 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Thessalonians 5, and the reason for that is to make room for that rapture event, which is that moment prior to the Great Tribulation and the Millennium. Now, with that kind of really simple survey of what we looked at, let's now get into our content this week. This week is going to be a transition for us into the final two topics, being the Great Tribulation and the Millennium. And what's going to be key for us to connect the dots between whether or not there is a rapture event for the church and then a separate moment of time for ethnic Israel called the Great Tribulation and the Millennium is how we understand the concept of this age and the age to come. So let's look at a few passages of Scripture in order to wrap our minds around this. Um, I'll read the first one, Matthew 12, 25-32. I would like to get a few volunteers to read the remaining ones. So somebody want to look up Mark 10, 29-31. If you want to do that, go ahead and just say so real quick so we know that somebody's got it. <coughs> I'll take it. All right, cool. Thank you. Uh, Luke 20, 34 through 36. Okay, I'll take that one. All right. I uh, think our microphones turned off. Um, I don't think so. I haven't muted anybody. Yeah, if you are talking and we can't hear you, make sure you're not muted, but you shouldn't be um, unless you muted yourself. Okay, so we've got Mark, we've got Luke. Now, 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 8. Somebody want to take that? Uh, Laura's got it. 
Okay. And then Ephesians 1, 19 through 23. Sam's got it. All right. I like it. Okay, while you guys are finding your places there, I will go ahead and read for us uh, Matthew 12, 25 through 32. And here is what it says. It says, knowing their thoughts, he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. All right, can we read Mark 10, 29, 31? Jesus said, truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Okay, Luke. And Jesus said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, for they cannot die anymore because they are equal to the angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. Okay, 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 8. Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Okay, and then <laughs> Ephesians 1. Uh Please forgive me, but I can't. I hate to start in the middle of a sentence, and Paul <laughs> uses these run-on sentences. So I'm going to start with 15, if that's all right with you, Kevin. It's, it's a $5 surcharge, but go ahead. <laughs> I'll take it. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And, now this is where the verse starts, or 19, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion 
and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Okay, thank you all for reading. And the point of all of that is, is this, that scripture situates this age and the age to come as the two successive progressions of redemptive history. We talked about redemptive history as a term is literally God's plan of redemption working its way all throughout the course of history. And the emphasis on that is that God has one plan in mind, not a plan B, not a revision or anything of the sort, not a secret secondary plan, but one plan working itself out all the way from what we read in Genesis to the final words in the book of Revelation. This is what we call redemptive history, and it's centered upon the person and work of Christ. Now, that could be, could be used as another way for us to just describe the gospel message as a whole, um, beyond just the, the life of Jesus, which we read in the gospels, but the full content and significance of his life. But the reason we want to make that emphasis about redemptive history is because when you get to dispensational theology— while they might accept the term redemptive history, there's a repeated insistence that what we are experiencing now, as they describe it as the church age, is this secondary plan, this before it came to be a reality, it was totally unknown, totally um, incomprehensible from anybody on earth, but it was this plan that God had decided on. And the plan is this, that when Jesus came to the earth, he offered a kingdom to ethnic Israel. And when they rejected that kingdom and crucified him, God, in essence, froze the spiritual time clock and the covenantal blessings for ethnic Israel and entered into for lack of a better phrase, the halftime show, which is the church age. And he is doing this moment in time of saving us as Gentiles, but there is a limit to this time frame, And that limit is realized when our moment is done away with, we are raptured out of the earth and then God can resume his original plan with ethnic Israel. That is the idea of dispensationalism. And because of that, it's very hard to insist that God has a unified singular plan. So they might say the way that we are redeemed, or in general, redemptive history is one plan, but when you really get down to it, in dispensational theology, it's really two plans happening, and they're running linear. They're running alongside each other. They never cross or intertwine because you have to keep God's plan with the Gentiles or the church separate from God's plan for ethnic Israel. Now, we read those verses because Scripture not only speaks of redemptive history as this age and the age to come, but scripture also speaks of it as universal realities that transcend somebody's ethnicity. The reason that matters is because we can understand that this age and the age to come has to do with God's one unified plan instead of two separate plans that some apply to Israel, some apply to the church. For example, we read in Matthew 12, 32, that the difference between this age and the age to come is the reality of forgiveness of sins. That means that whatever this age to come is, when it is realized, goes beyond the scope of a chance for forgiveness, if we want to put it that way. 
in Mark, we read that eternal life, the granting of eternal life is fully realized in the age to come. So again, whatever the age to come is, goes beyond the scope of any so-called moment or chance to be saved. In Luke 20, we read that this age and the age to come depicts when marriage is a reality and when we have moved beyond the shadow of marriage to the substance of marriage, which is Christ and his bride. First Corinthians, this age and the age to come is the difference between the here and now working and practice of wisdom. And then when we move to a point where we walk by sight and see by sight, as opposed to walking by faith in anticipation of what's to come. And then finally in Ephesians, we read that Jesus as the centerpiece of it all, his reign and his dominion, not only applies to the age to come, which we're waiting for, but in looking at it from the other perspective, his reign and dominion also is a reality in this present age. So when we bring those two together, we should at least not be looking for some additional dispensation or some additional time period that's going to happen between what is going on now and what is eventually going to happen when we have the consummation of all things. Because since we are living and breathing and existing in this age, what we are waiting for, according to the full scope of scripture, we're waiting for the age to come. And if the age to come is a moment in time where the normal workings of forgiveness, eternal life, marriage, and wisdom are no longer needed in the temporal sense, then that means we can't be waiting on anything short of or less than the full consummation of all things. Resurrection from the dead, no more sin, no more suffering, no more death. And if that's the case, then it makes no sense for us to insist that before this finality happens when Jesus returns and makes all things new, there's actually going to be a few more temporal time periods that are taking place, such as the rapture, which we read about last week, and then at least a seven-year tribulation on earth, and then at least a 1,000-year reign on earth, all of that before Jesus makes all things new. Again, the insistence on this age and age to come makes it hard to kind of shoehorn in those additional moments of time. So when we think about that, it brings us back to that discussion, which we read uh, last week when I was, I read actually a lot of segments from uh, J. Dwight Pentecost's book, Things to Come, where he made the point, you remember, that there's a difference between the last day and the last days, the day of the Lord, the day of Christ, all those things, right? They're all different moments in time. He makes that insistence. Well, when we think about that, it means that dispensational theology actually makes a separation between what's described as the day of the Lord in the Bible and the day of Christ in the Bible. And the reason that they do this is to organize their end times system. They want to organize it in a way that gives room for the rapture, the tribulation, the millennium. But I want to show you again that it's not wrong for us to make generalizations instead of these uh, insistent, distinct time periods in this rigid type system. And I want to show you that um, in a few different passages of Scripture. Um, is it necessary for us to think that when you're thinking about end times in the last days, is it necessary to think that the day of the Lord, which we hear about a lot in the Old Testament especially, and the day of Christ are two separate days? Now, that might sound like a tricky question, but you may not know this, but dispensational theology insists that there are two different days. But in my view, it doesn't stand up to the teaching of scripture because for example you read in second peter uh, 
in a lot of different places about this idea. If you want to turn there, um, it's six o'clock. You can see it. You can see it later on the on the notes um, that I'll send out. Our clocks. But Second Peter, there's at least three sections in this book that refer to this idea. Uh, the first one you can see in Second Peter chapter two, uh, verse number nine. If you want to turn there, if not, I'll share it with you later. But this idea of this day that we're waiting on, Peter describes in, in verse number nine of chapter two in Second Peter, he says this, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. So that day that Peter has in mind is a day described as this day of judgment. Well, you go further on in Second Peter, chapter number three, and he talks about this idea of a day yet again in uh, Second Peter 3, verse number 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Then again, in Second Peter 3, he says, verse number 18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. So this idea of days, according to Second Peter, includes the idea of the day of eternity, the day of the Lord, and even the day of judgment. Additional examples in the New Testament include, and I'll just fly through these because I got about 10 more, so I won't take the time to read all of them in their entirety, but 2 Timothy 4.8 refers to this day as a day of award. 2 Thessalonians 2 is a day where before it, there will be a falling away. Of course, we read 1 Thessalonians 5 about the day of the Lord. Then 2 Corinthians 1.14 is the day of of righteous boasting. 1 Corinthians 5 is a day that is going to bring about salvation, and including in 1 Corinthians is also the day of guiltlessness, the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Philippians, uh, which we you know Josh preached through it not too terribly long ago, in the beginning of it, Paul makes the point about how our salvation is a uh, not a temporal thing, not something that can be lost, but something that is preserved for us. And the way that he says that is that our salvation will be preserved and we will be kept blameless all the way to the day of Christ. And then Philippians 1.6, the day of Jesus Christ again. And then finally, in Romans 2.16, this is really interesting. He, Paul calls the day of judgment this, the day of judgment by Jesus Christ where it says God judges the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. So are these separate days or are they the same day, the same reality? Same. If you were to take covenant theology or reform theology as a full system um, of biblical theology, then you would hear a lot of people um, insist on what I'm saying about this Two age model is the proper term for it. This age and the age to come. That's the general way that we can kind of divide the scriptures. This age and this this age and the age to come. But included in that is also the teaching that what we're waiting on, if you read the historic creeds and confessions, we're waiting on the second coming of Christ. And that second coming encapsulates resurrection, final judgment rewards for believers, and new heavens and new earth. New earth. That's all brought into that framework of Jesus' second coming. We're waiting for all those things to be experienced and fulfilled in Jesus' second coming. That's just the general um, view of Scripture in the historic confessions and creeds as well as um, in covenant theology. So is it necessary for us to separate all these ideas of days as some refer to ethnic Israel, some refer to the church, 
some refer to before the tribulation, some refer to the millennium, right? All these kind of subcategories and arrangements. Is it necessary for us to do that? Well, I think that what you have in the New Testament is just an example of redemptive historical language. It's not necessary for us to think that all those scriptures I just read are talking about different events for different days. Rather, they're talking about the same day with redemptive historical language. If that's true, that means that the day of the Lord and the day of Christ are the same days. They're not two different days, as is argued in dispensationalism. The argument is that in dispensationalism, the day of Christ refers to everything that has to do with blessing and reward for the church. So it's a judgment, but it's a judgment that doesn't have any condemnation, doesn't have any punishment. It's a judgment for rewards and, and things like that. Whereas the day of the Lord has to do with the final judgment, or it has to do with the time of tribulation for ethnic Israel. In my mind, it's kind of a bizarre, unnecessary division being made that, again, it's, it's just not necessary. And, an, but an example of how this happens, where you see ideas that are ascribed to God in general or the Lord in the Old Testament, and then other ideas that are ascribed to Christ, well, we see this happening in several different instances in the Bible as just an example of redemptive historical language. For example... Genesis 1 in the Old Testament, broadly speaking, refer to God as the creator, right? There's no explicit reference to Jesus Christ is the creator of heavens and earth in the Old Testament, at least worded explicitly. But it is explicit when you get to the New Testament that Jesus Christ is the creator. Jesus Christ is divine. He is God. Well, we could do what is typical in dispensationalism and say, well, see, there's creation as it refers to God, and then there's this different kind of creation that refers to Jesus. Like Jesus is the creator in this sense, God's the creator in this sense. Well, of course, no dispensationalist does that because then you kind of run into a huge problem. You're talking about two different gods, two different creation events. And of course, they wouldn't say that. They would say, well, Scripture tells us in the New Testament that what we see happening in the Old Testament involves and relates to Jesus Christ himself. You see that in the New Testament with the grand language that you see, such as in the beginning of Hebrews or Colossians or even Ephesians about Jesus as the creator. So this is just an example of redemptive historical language. When you have the creation account in the Old Testament, ascribed to God, and then in the New Testament, ascribed to Jesus. They're not two different creation accounts. It's just the redemptive historical implications that Jesus is divine and therefore takes part and is the creator himself. Well, the same thing can be said about the day of the Lord and the day of Christ in the Old and New Testament. It's just an example of redemptive historical language. It's not two different days, two different events, two different people groups, it's the same day, but it's ascribed to Christ. And that best example of that is in Romans 2.16, that the day of judgment is when God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. The day of Christ, the day of the Lord, one and the same. And when we understand that, it starts to become unnecessary for us to make all these fine-tooth comb distinctions and divisions, which we're starting to see again and again in dispensational theology. So before we move to our last uh, passage um, to see this play out, um, I want to just open up for any questions that you all may have at this point. If you don't have any, we can move on, but I want to give you just a moment if you do have any. Okay, moving on. So our last passage that we're going to look at is what we looked at very briefly last week, but we didn't get into the nitty-gritty of it. We will uh, today in our last few minutes together. 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, 
Nobody argues the fact that 1 Corinthians 15 refers to the resurrection. But the issue is this. I want to read this quote to you from J. Dwight Pentecost. He says this. He's talking about the resurrection, but the problem is he's talking about not one, not two, not three, not four, but five different resurrections. Here's what he says. The order of events in the resurrection program would be this. First, the resurrection of Christ as the beginning of the resurrection program. Second, the resurrection of the church. I'm sorry, the resurrection of the church age saints at the rapture. Third, the resurrection of the tribulation period saints, together with four, the resurrection of the Old Testament saints at the second advent of Christ to the earth. And finally, fifth, the end of the millennial age of the unsaved dead at the end of the millennial age. So he says this, the first four stages of, res of resurrection would all be included as a resurrection to life inasmuch as all who receive eternal life and the last resurrection would be resurrection unto damnation inasmuch as all receive eternal judgment at that time. So he makes this point. In dispensationalism, there are five different periods of time where resurrections are occurring. Four of those refer to believers, whether they're Jews or Gentiles, and their resurrection and judgment has all to do with reward, no idea of punishment or damnation. And then the final resurrection refers to everybody that's unsaved. So what you have essentially in dispensationalism are five different moments in time where a resurrection happens. That is incredibly different from what you have in uh, historical theology through, again, confessions and creeds that we believe in the resurrection of the dead and Jesus is going to return to judge the living and the dead. There's no mention of five different time periods. And what's more here is that these time periods are at least divided in some way by 1,000 years. Because he says what you read in 1 Thessalonians 4, that's the rapture. That's one resurrection. Then you have a resurrection for people during the tribulation period. Then you have another one for the tribulation or for the millennial period. And then finally, you have another one for the final judgment, which is only unbelievers. Now, again, it's very complicated. It's an it's a incredibly complicated system to view the scriptures this way. And it's distinctions and divisions that are entirely unnecessary. And when we're looking at 1 Corinthians 15, what is brought up here is, <clears throat> does Paul leave room for four or five different resurrections? Is that, is that really what's being described here? So we're going to just kind of survey the chapter in our last uh, couple minutes uh, together. But you can look with me especially at uh, verse number 20 in 1 Corinthians 15. In verse number 20 through 27, I'll just read it for us uh, very quickly here, it says this. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection 
under him. I'll go ahead and read 28 as well. When all things are subjected to him, then the son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. So is this referring to the same thing that we read in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5? Remember the argument being made in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5 with dispensationalists is that whatever resurrection is being referred to is only referring to the church, not referring to ethnic Israel, not referring to non-believers, only referring to the church. And the reason for that is all the church has to be resurrected because they got to be raptured and moved off the earth because they're not going to participate in the great tribulation. That's the rationale for it. But I want you to notice a couple things here in this passage. It says that when Jesus returns, it's going to happen in verse 23, this order. What's the order of those who are going to be made alive? Well, here's the order. Verse 23, those who are dead in Christ, those who are alive at his coming, and then comes the end. Verse 24 is what he says. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God, the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. The reason that's significant is because this idea of returning and resurrecting the saints that we read about here is very similar to what we read in 1 Thessalonians 4. If it is the same passage, that means that the events in 1 Thessalonians 4 is what happens right before what Paul calls the end. And that means that whatever's happening in 1 Thessalonians 4, once it takes place, there's no more time period left for a seven-year tribulation and a 1,000-year millennium and all these other events. Instead, what's happening is the resurrection of the dead and then the end. And what does Paul mean by the end? Well, he means this that the last enemy to be destroyed is death. When he says the end, he really means the end. If we're talking about a time where there's no more death, that's the end. I mean, it's not kind of the end. It's not part one of the end. It's the end. If you have no more death, then the only possible reasoning is that everybody who's going to be resurrected is resurrected and sin and death have been totally destroyed and the new heavens and new earth are inaugurated. Now, that is a classical Reformed view of this passage, but it's certainly not the view of dispensationalism. Now, I also want to point out, um, if you do want to, you can turn back to 1 Thessalonians 4, but if you want, I just want to make this, this point. Um, when we read 1 Thessalonians 4, another way for us to kind of test whether or not we're reading about the same event is this. What are the earmarks of the event in 1 Thessalonians 4? Well, they are this, which we looked at last week and which I referred to again this week. It is a cry, a voice, and a sound of the last trumpet. Those are what Paul describes as the descriptions of 1 Thessalonians 4. Now, dispensationalists will say 1 Thessalonians 4 is not the same thing as 1 Corinthians 15. But it's interesting to note as well, when you look at 1 Corinthians 15 at the end of the chapter, that Paul says this in verse number 50. Follow along with me here if you're there in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Now, listen closely to this verse. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. Very much the same language that you see in 1 Thessalonians 4. Now, the problem is this. In dispensational theology, they say 
first first Thessalonians four is just talking about the church's resurrection before the rapture. But if that's true, then you have at least a seven year tribulation, at least a one thousand year millennium, when you still have life and death and marriage and all the things that we read about, which are separated in this age and the age to come. Now, notice what Paul says here. Once this happens, once that trumpet is sounded, verse 53, the perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. According to Paul, when the trumpet sounds and the resurrection happens, there will no longer be a reality of death. There will no longer be a reality of sin. If that's true, and he says so, so it is, there's no room for us to say that 1 Thessalonians 4, which is also described as when the trumpet sounds, refers to a rapture or a just part one of a five-part series of resurrections where there's still going to be sin and death after that resurrection during the Great Tribulation and during the millennium. That's why it's so important for us to judge scripture with scripture. We read about that way back in our um, initial weeks in this class where I made the point that the Westminster Confession of Faith says you should always interpret scripture with scripture. If there is a passage that seems to be somewhat obscure, somewhat less clear, go to a clearer passage and let that unclear passage be informed by what is clear. This is a classic example of that. If there's a question as to whether or not 1 Thessalonians 4 is talking about a final resurrection and whatnot, or just this moment in time where the church is raptured and it's one of five resurrections, do we just settle for that or do we look to a more clear passage? And what we're doing is we're looking at a clear, explicit passage being 1 Corinthians 15. When we put them side by side, the description is the same. You have Jesus returning with the first fruits and those at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Same language as 1 Thessalonians 4. And you have the final trumpet being sounded in both 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15. And again, the point is, if that's true, then death is abolished, sin is abolished, and then there's no room for this distinct time period. And all that to say, this age and the age to come is really the best structure of studying in times. It's not to say that we just throw out ideas of the rapture. We throw out ideas of a tribulation. We throw out ideas of millennium. We're not going to do that. We're going to look at them in the coming weeks. But what we are doing is letting our view of them be informed not by the hottest theology that's out on the shelves at, at the time or be informed by how many world wars we've been in or informed by anything like that but instead we're letting scripture dictate to us how far we go in our definitions and how far we go in our distinctions so that's why it matters because if we're able to suggest some problems with dispensationalism right now especially with the idea of the rapture by looking at a general this age and age to come structure of the Bible, then it's going to be a lot more easy for us to navigate through perhaps the two most controversial topics um, in any end times view, and that is the Great Tribulation and the Millennium. And those are the last two that we'll look at in our uh, remaining weeks. So I'll show you this. We are almost done. I mean, we're definitely like now pushing two-thirds of the way through. So you see what we have left. We're going to spend two sessions on the Great Tribulation. 
uh, which really it's the best way to understand it is we're basically doing the what of the great tribulation and the when, and then for the millennium, same idea, the what and the when, and then we'll have a final class together, Lord willing. For further reading, I would really commend this to you the most. Uh, most of the distinctions and even a lot of the scriptures that I uh, looked at here when I was making the points earlier about this age and the age to come, they came straight from Professor Riddlebarger in his book on millennialism. Highly commend that book to you. It's excellent. And again, I've made the point that uh, this man grew up as a dispensationalist. And so he's very sympathetic to dispensationalism he understands the argument. He understands the points that are being made. And he does a, just really a great job of offering biblical evidence to refute a lot of the classical dispensationalism understandings. And now I hope you're ready for this because for next week, I have a huge list for you. Any of these will be great, uh, but probably the one that's going to give you the, the most uh, uh, bang for Your Buck is uh, one of my favorite books of all time. It's the very top one, The Last Days According to Jesus. Now, if you're not an avid reader, and if you don't feel like you can finish an entire book before next week, um, then uh, you're setting your bar way too low. No. Um, there's actually a, a video lecture series of The Last Days According to Jesus. Would highly commend that to you um, because uh, R.C. Sproul really challenges the majority report about the great tribulation uh, which of course is dispensational theology um, when you're in all of the books and movies and uh, evangelical pop culture um, then your voice is the loudest and that's certainly the case in dispensationalism so most ideas that we hear about about the end times or about a great tribulation or a mark of the beast and all those kind of things that's all dispensational theology and rc Sproul really challenges that. I don't agree with everything he says, uh, but who am I to question the great Dr. Sproul? Um, another book that is very, very similar uh, to R.C. Sproul's, um, but one that spends more time on the millennium. So the next one in Eschatology of Victory is great, not only for the Great Tribulation, but also for uh, the millennium. Uh, so this book list here is going to basically stay the same for the rest of our time together. Um, if you want to know the two most popular reform views of the millennium, not just the millennium, but an entire like biblical interpretation structure, I would commend that book, Kim Riddlebarger on millennialism, as well as post-millennialism by Keith Matheson. Uh, Keith is a professor at Reformation Bible College there, which R.C. Sproul started. That book is excellent as well. Uh, the works of Josephus, there's no possible way you'll finish that by next week. <laughs> it's massive, as many of you know. But R.C. Sproul does refer to it a lot in the last days, so you kind of get a two-for-one special there if you watch that video series. And then dispensationalism, things to come. Uh, Dr. Pentecost really covers every element, uh, as we've seen. And then two key passages of Scripture, Daniel 9 and Matthew 24. Um, and that is really it. I'll leave that on the screen, uh, but any closing questions or thoughts uh, that you have, uh, go ahead. Yes, uh, this is Jeff Steele. Hey, Jeff. Hello. Um, Hello. Throughout church history, was the resurrection an issue of controversy at all? Uh, as much as it is, like you stated, the five different resurrections of dispensationalism? I think that you do see elements of it as you get kind of in the couple hundred years removed from the Old Testament and so on and so forth. You kind of see that view springing up a little bit. Uh, Dwight Pentecost literally calls the doctrine of a general resurrection, which means a uh, kind of one for all resurrection. Which, which I would agree with. Um, <clears throat> he calls that an unbiblical doctrine. So he doesn't even leave room for that as a possibility. Um, and what he does, Jeff, is he um, wants to point back to people like Justin Martyr and other people in uh, church history, the church fathers, uh, 
and he tries to make the case that they all um, had this idea that there were different resurrections for different people. Um, I think that it's a weak case, though. And frankly, um, I think that the view of the New Testament was that there was always the idea of just one resurrection. And case in point is that Paul would have no reason to assure the Thessalonians in chapter 4 about that the day of the Lord had already come and they missed out on it. That would almost be a, a moot point if there were more than one resurrection. It's almost like if you miss out on this resurrection, you can jump in on the next one eventually. Um, but Paul's argument really only makes sense if the typical view at the time of the New Testament was that there was one resurrection. I think a great place to look as well, which I didn't even reference this, but is in uh, Daniel 12. Uh, Daniel uh, mentions the resurrection of the just and the unjust, and he mentions it as um, one singular event. The problem with that passage is that Pentecost and other dispensationalists will say, well, see, Daniel doesn't give a time reference there so there's no need for us to think that they happen at the same time. Well, that's a, that's a terrible rationale because really we should be saying the opposite. We should be saying since Daniel doesn't make a um, distinct separation between this resurrection of the just and the unjust, we have no reason to think that they're two separate time periods. So uh, that's, that's another passage of scripture there. But to answer your question, I don't really think that it was a a predominant view happening. If anything, there was an idea that you could potentially have Christians saved before the millennium that would be resurrected unto the millennium to participate in that, and then anybody that lives and dies during the millennium will be resurrected after it. I think that's about as far as you could really see ideas, wheels turning, in church history, but I don't see evidence, at least in my limited scope here, of this early view that ethnic Israel had one resurrection, the church had another, and you had all these different divisions like that. Do you, have you, are, Josh, are you familiar with that view being predominant before kind of the 1800s dispensationalism really rose? Uh, no, not that one. Um... I think what you mentioned here just a minute ago that um, in the context of the millennium, which I know we'll get to this revelation 20 does mention a first resurrection and a second resurrection. And there was a difference of opinion on what that referred to. Um, the early, many of the early fathers were premillennial, but they weren't of, there was, there was not a dispensationalism, a dispensational premillennial. It, just the classic view of, of uh, that Christ would reign for a thousand years, literally on the earth um, or physically. But uh, you have uh, you have others like Augustine who see that more in keeping with um, the sim symbolism and figurative language of, of Revelation. So the first resurrection, perhaps referring to the believer's death. Uh, being with Christ, and then the second resurrection being the general resurrection. Others would say uh, the first resurrection refers to our regeneration. You know, we are born again, um, brought from brought from spiritual death, and then that second resurrection refers to the general resurrection. But again, I think as you mentioned the creeds earlier, uh, we confess simply the resurrection from the dead. Right, and the, that the is that kind of emphasis there. Um, yeah, good point. And uh, by the way, if um, if you all are not very keen on amillennialism, postmillennialism, premillennial, all those phrases, uh, that is our first uh, <clears throat> first on the docket next uh, next class. We're going to do a survey of what those mean, how they are like, how they're different, to set the stage for our discussion about. The Great Tribulation and the and the Millennium. Anybody have any other questions before we close? Yes, I have a question. Yes. Have you thought about what's your thought of the dating of Revelation? 
Is it before 70 AD or after? Um, it really depends on what day of the week you're talking to me. <laughs> that's, that's my, that's my honest answer. Um, we, and, and I'll give a, I'll give a better answer to that. Um, seriously, I have, I have toyed back and forth with, uh, with which one seems to be right. I think on a normal day, I would say it's uh, post 70 AD. Um, but I, I do understand that argument that Revelation was written before 70 AD. And I certainly do think that it is possible. Um, but I, I'm, not, I'm not resolved in that, in that view yet. Yeah, but if I talk to Harold long enough, though, I will be. Oh, <laughs> I've got a quick question. Yes. Okay. Are any of these resources available in the church library? Um, they are, I, you know what, I'll go up there. I'll go over there and look because I'm actually here at the building. I'm not 100% sure. Um, the la actually, I take that back. I have seen The Last Days According to Jesus on the bookshelf. So I do know that's here. The lecture series or the book? The book. The book. Oh, yeah, the bad. book is here. Um, the book obviously goes into way more detail than the lectures, but the lectures are great, especially for like a from now to next week thing. Yeah. Uh, I'll, take, I'll go take a look at, I would probably imagine that all millennialism book would be there. Um, Josephus is probably there. Um, I'll, I'll look before I leave to, to see. Thank you. Yeah. I've got a couple of those uh, right behind you, Kevin, that uh, we can make available as well. Yeah, and I and I and I do have um, I do have all of them, obviously myself as well. So I could always like scan pages or whatever and send them out upon request or let you borrow them. I, I think that lecture series too might be free right now. Uh, I'm not sure. Good, good, yeah, good. That, good. That, that first dibs. Was, I'm sorry. Go ahead. First dibs. <laughs> Yeah, that lecture series was already one of the free ones, so I'm, I know that it's definitely free to, to watch. Okay, the, anything else? Yes, um, Josh was wondering if you were using a coaster when you placed your cup on his desk. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to. I would have, but I don't see one, so. Uh... I'm sorry. You use, use one of Josh's books. <laughs> okay anything else all right well as always thank you all for your participation great to be able to do this with you week after week um thank you yes absolutely very welcome uh josh yes. would like to close us out in prayer I'd be happy to it's good to see you all uh lord we thank you again for this time together uh, to consider your word. We pray for a greater understanding of it. We know these are difficult matters that Christians have, uh, have disagreed about and have sought peace and unity over uh, through the history of the New Covenant Church. Uh, but we do pray for greater understanding, a greater measure of your spirit so that we might know, um, understand your word and, and trust you for it. We, uh, we thank you for Kevin and his, how you've gifted him. Um, we thank you for the uh, unity we have as a body of Christ, the uh, teachable spirit, and the willingness to submit ourselves to your word. We ask that you be with us now as we go into this week to fulfill our vocations in accordance with your will. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.